Hey everyone, Mike here. Just want to let you know that the stream that you're about to watch was recorded via the DevOps Lounge My Discord server. I'd love you to join me over there so that you can ask questions during the live streams. If you want to do that, head on over to chat.learndevops.com.au. You'll be forward to Discord. I really hope that we get to connect soon. Enjoy the stream. Code structure for managing multiple customer subscriptions in Azure uh, Infra. So what he's essentially uh, looking at doing here is, is, is essentially it boils down to being an MSP. So this, this person's question is code structure for managing multiple customers subscriptions in Azure infrastructure. They're, they're essentially an MSP by the sound of it. So there's no real, it's a big, very big question and there is no real answer that's going to be a catch all answer. And of course, you know, what questions really in this industry actually have an answer that's just sort of like a silver bullet, like, oh, if you just do this, it's going to be perfect and everything's going to be good. It's sort of like, just use Kubernetes, it takes care of a lot of problems, but it also introduces a lot of problems as well. So it's not just a sort of like a, a silver bullet answer. So it, it's very clear to me that this person, I believe, is actually in an MSP environment and they're asking, how do they actually manage their modules what do they do so they've got all these modules that produce products they have manage uh, infrastructure around products uh, landing zones and so on and so forth so i can't give this guy i can't give an answer specifically to this guy's situation but what i can do is i can give an answer to a general sort of module organization that i find works in in an MSP environment more specifically, but also sort of in any environment really. And they're just sort of some best practices around Terraform modules. So I think that what this person and most people need to do is they need to construct a very well, a very well maintained module structure that makes it very easy to compose solutions for your customers. So whether your customers are internal departments within your large enterprise or your government department, or whether you're in an MSP and those customers are actual external uh, organizer, actual external companies, actual external entities that are running their own individual business, you want to maintain modules in a way that they can be consumed individually and that they solve a particular problem really well. And then you can compose them together like Lego in order to get an overall complete solution. So this means having modules that solve specific infrastructure problem with some very tight controls in place. So let's let's say we've got a WordPress solution that we offer. So we have a product product where we offer managed WordPress installations. You might create a Terraform module that stands up all of the things for you. So it stands up the uh, you might have something that handles all your networking. So a separate module to the WordPress one does your VPCs, does all your internet gateways, or your transit gateways, or your security around that. I might put like a uh, subnet with a PA firewall uh, in there for you, and then you have everything routed through that. So, and then eventually you end up with like a VPC that's configured in the way that your company wants with billing and all this kind of stuff, all going out into centralized environments. But you then have nothing else in the middle and you're right. That's like a base sort of network ready to go. So that would be one module that gets sort of VPC ready to go. Then you'd create like a WordPress module, for example, because that, that might be the, the, that might be the problem that you're trying to solve is to manage WordPress. So what you would do in this module, you would set up a few subnets for multi AZ. You would set up all your knuckles and your security groups. You might set up an R, a managed R, database via RDS. Uh, maybe even go really far and have like a Redis cache for caching WordPress. It can support that provided you put the plugin in place and you might use EFS to have that sort of shared file system for uploads and so on and so forth, depending on how you wanted to do it. But you would write that module to build all the infrastructure for you to handle that WordPress situation. So once you've got that written, you're going to want to put some really, really tight controls around that, such as semantic versioning would be the first one so i do have a, a a theory that i have at the moment on on using something other than semantic versioning but i won't go into that here semantic versioning is a, is a classic system that many many software developers uh know love and use they know it really well it's a three octet system which means you get a major minor and patch version and it's three little octets separated by a dot and they sort of give you an indication 
as to what the software might look like behind a particular version. And then when you transition from one version to another, you kind of get an idea of whether the transition is going to introduce any kind of breaking change for you. So if you head over to semvar.org, so S-E-M-V-E-R.org, you'll see the semantic versioning sort of, uh, if you like RFC, the sort of standard as to how you do semantic versioning. That's the first thing that I would recommend on modules is that you have a semantic version in place. If you don't have a semantic version in place, you're going to have to rely on git commit, basically, git commit hashes, uh, git just raw git tags that could just be anything. And it makes it really, really difficult for people to know, A, was there an update? And B, what does that update do? Is it a major change? Is it a minor change? Is it just a patch? And so on and so forth. Semantic versions help you gain a bit of visibility between changes. So that's the first thing I'd recommend you do on all of your modules. The second thing is a solid documentation, and I would pop that inside of just a readme file. I wouldn't go out to, X. I'd keep it as close to the code as possible in this particular case. I wouldn't go out to Confluence. I would keep it inside the readme. And what you want in that documentation is primarily an explanation as to what the what problem the module solves, what things it won't do, what inputs it expects, what outputs it will give you, and what infrastructure it will build. And then people reviewing the module can determine whether it actually fits their needs? Will it actually solve the problem that they're looking for? And if you list in the, a particular problem that it does not solve, then they've got the choice of either forking that module and creating their own version of it or doing a pull request or a merge request and so on and so forth. So solid documentation is is, is really, really important. And the final thing I would add at the bottom of that documentation, uh, or maybe even at the top, just to get people sort of going quickly if, they, if they're very confident that the module is correct for them, is some examples on how to actually operate that that module, that how to actually use that module. So an example at the top that says, actual example Terraform code. Here's how you source it. Here's how you reference a particular version. Here are the inputs, and this will we would yield this kind of output. So example, even just one example, can be very very powerful. So that's going to be really really important. Good inputs with validation and description. So when you've got your variables, uh, you may not, you may or may not know this. So when you create a, a module in Terraform and you create a, a variable, that variable acts as an input to that module. So when you call it, you can define the value to that variable. I recommend putting solid descriptions on there so that it's very clear from people looking at the code what that variable does and what it's used for. Because sometimes the variable name can be hard to make it sort of obvious. If it's just AMI ID, that's sort of really, really obvious. But if it's something more convoluted than that, then you may need a very, a, a, you may need a good description in there that people can use in order to um, try to determine what that does. And of course, validation as well. So if you know that the input needs to take an IP address, then set the validation to a regular expression that's suitable for IPv4 addresses. That way, when people are using the module and they're passing in something that doesn't match the correct IPv4 regular expression, they're getting knocked back straight away. So Terraform will try and compile that code and it'll knock them back. Uh, the same with outputs as well. Make sure that your outputs have got a good description on them. There's no validation on outputs, but make sure they've got a good description on them so people know what to expect from that output. Because again, the, the actual name of it might not actually be obvious. I would say that you should also lock down that main branch. Okay, so if you're working with older repositories that already exist and you're actually going to uplift them based on this advice that branch might be called master we've shifted away from that to call it main so it might be master or main but depending on whatever it is you want to lock that down so that virtually no one can push directly to that branch you don't want anyone pushing directly to the branch you want them to create a you want them to create another branch that they push to and then you want to create a merge request into the master branch and then on top of that you then want to force merge requests and code reviews so you force them to do a merge request from a feature branch into master, and then you force them to do a code review. So that has to be approved by someone else. They can't approve their own merge request. This brings stability and security to the module because now you've got multiple eyes looking over changes to that module, which means that customers further down the line can actually be very confident in the stability of that module. So there, there are definitely some very specific things I would do on the module front there. Every module should also have its own CI pipeline doing a few minimum things, in my opinion, so just a few minimum things. The first thing you should be doing right at the very beginning is probably a Terraform FMT. So that's a Terraform format, but you want to use it with the dash C option as well. So you want to do a Terraform FMT dash C, and that will do a check for you. And if it finds linting problems, indentation problems, 
poor usage of variable interpolation and things like that. It will, the dash C means that it won't change any files. It'll just exit with a non-zero exit code, which means your pipeline will fail, which is what you want to happen. If there are problems with the code, you want, you want the pipeline to fail. The next one would be Terraform validate, which is then validating all of the syntax and that variables are all correct. FMT won't do that, but validate will look to make sure that you're not referencing variables that don't exist. It, FMT just looks at the, the style of the code, whereas validate will, will check the actual code is valid and actually will compile down into something that, that Terraform can accept and work with. And if possible, try and do, um, try and work in an, a full apply destroy cycle. If you can, if you can get a full apply and destroy cycle in for that module where you just consume it, you build it out, you build up that module, you test it, and then you destroy it again. That's really, really powerful because the thing is, even if your Terraform code passes an FMT and it passes a validate, that doesn't mean that the values that you're feeding in are values that AWS's API are going to be happy with. For example, the AMI ID to an EC2 instance, I don't believe the provider for AWS will actually check that ID to make sure it matches a regular expression or is valid. It'll just take it and go, okay, as long as it's a string, it'll just take it and then it will pass it through. And then the, obviously the AWS API will then say, I don't know, I don't know what ABC123 is. So you want to make sure that even though the module is syntactically correct, you want to make sure that given, given certain values, especially default values, you want to make sure that and apply actually does actually work when it hits the AWS or the GCP or the Azure API. So that's just some something that you can do there to make the modules uh, really, really watertight inside of a CI pipeline. And then if you really want to really want to lock them down, you can do some static code analysis too with something like TFSec. So you can throw TFSec in there. You can get TFSec to just analyze that code for potential security problems, potential code that's doing negative things from a security perspective and it can go ahead and and um and warn you and, and ideally stop the pipeline to say hey you shouldn't be doing this with this security group you should be doing this instead so that's always very very powerful and then finally there's one more thing you can do then in this sort of msp environment or where you're serving customers is for the customer build outs you can then consume the relevant modules inside of an inside of another repository and that repository will set a, a essentially represents state um, and it will build out everything and it will all go live. And then there's a few things you can do there to really bring a lot of stability. Uh, the first thing you can do is you can pin down the module versions that you're consuming. So if you've got your VPC module, then you've got this terror, you've got this uh, WordPress module on there that we discussed earlier. And then you might have a couple of other modules that do things like Splunk or New Relic and install all this stuff for you. You want to pin down to a particular version. So if they're all on version one, pin to version one. And then when version two comes out, it won't affect this customer until you want to actually upgrade the modules directly to the new version. That's pretty important. You don't want a breaking change to come through and break all of your customers. So you want to pin to that particular version. You can also define the Terraform version that you want to work with as well. So it's pretty important that you pin down that Terraform version that you're using. What this does, it prevents accidental essentially version upgrades. So when you run Terraform apply and it all finishes, the state file will have in it the, the minimum version of Terraform that is required to operate that state. If someone else comes along and uses a newer version, the actual state is upgraded to that newer version. And then the previous engineer who was using the next one down can no longer manage that state. They have to upgrade their Terraform in order to match. So you wanna, you wanna lock down that Terraform version too in order to prevent that awkward situation where everyone else has to then upgrade the entire stack to manage that state because one person used a slightly newer version locally on the system, which is also why CI pipelines are very powerful. If you're not running Terraform locally and you're doing it inside of a CI pipeline, then what you're effectively doing is getting rid of all of that risk because ter the CI pipelines Terraform version is locked in place. It's never going to upgrade unless you upgrade it. So that's a very powerful way of um, also bringing a lot of stability to the code base. And then, and then finally, the provider version as well. So if you're pulling in the AWS provider, you can lock down to a specific version there too. So I recommend that you do that in order to ensure that you're effectively just getting specific features that you want. It's all working fine. You're like, right, that's great. So unless a new feature comes along that we really need, or there's a serious security update or any security update, then we're not going to upgrade that 
AWS provider or we're going to always download this, download and use this very specific version of the AWS, for example, provider. And again, that just introduces stability. You don't want to change to that provider to break to break your code going forward and therefore break your customers. So look, there's a there's a lot more you can you can do. You can keep I can keep going on this, but obviously we're limited in time. And also in this particular case with this, with this customer, with this, but this uh, poster here on Reddit. We don't know who his customers are, what he's building. We've got a rough idea of what he's building here. We know that he's got multiple customers varying between IaaS and PaaS, so that makes it more complicated straight away. And so that's what I've given there is some general advice around how you can actually prepare a code base for management and making sure it stays stable. But I mean, there's, there's gonna be a lot of leeway, a lot of leeway in this with regards to how you actually go about how you actually go about doing this based on the environment that you're in. Very nice.